Hello Year 5s and welcome to Tuesday the 26th of January and this is our second um, English session for this week and if you remember we are writing a prologue aren't we based on um, the prologue of the Nowhere Emporium. Let's see what we can remember from yesterday. Can you remember the meaning of the word pallid? The pallid rays of winter sun reflected off the icy ground. Think back to yesterday, what does pallid mean? That's right, we can use the word pallid to describe something which is insipid, or in other words, lacking intensity. So if we say a pallid ray of winter sun, it means that the ray of sun isn't very hot, is it? It's pallid, it's not very intense. And we are going to start off this week with some new um, spelling rules. So last week we had a look at ants and ant. And can you remember which suffix? So a suffix is the letter string, isn't it? That goes at the end of the word um, was used for a noun and which was used for an adjective. Let's have a look at the two examples below. The fragrant flowers perfumed the air. Fragrant has used the suffix ant. Is that a noun or is that an adjective? And then we've got, I simply must buy this new fragrance. So fragrance has the suffix ant. Um, is that a noun or an adjective? Okay, so we use um, the suffix ant if we are describing an adjective. So the flowers were fragrant. That's an adjective, isn't it? And we use the suffix unts or antsy if we are referring to the noun. So the fragrance on the other um, slide here, that's referring to the perfume, isn't it? I must buy this new perfume or this new fragrance. So it is a noun. Okay, and if you remember our little rhyme that we looked at last week, um, sing it with me. A noun, a noun is a P-P-T-I, a place, a person, a thing or an idea. So a noun refers to a place, a person, a thing, or it can even be an idea, can't it? Like a feeling. OK, so for this set of sp spellings, we are now practising spelling unt adjectives that become unts or untsy nouns. So the suffix, the letter string is unt and unt or untsy, and they go at the end of uh, the root word. So we've got decent, that becomes decency. Excellent becomes excellence. Confident becomes confidence. Existent becomes existence. And innocent becomes innocence. Um, and decency, if we just have a look at this word decency, that has a similar meaning to having good manners. So we could say she had the decency to hold the door open for others. Right, I am going to call out one of the spelling words. So let's just have a look at our spelling words here. We've got decent, decency, innocent and innocence. And what I'm going to ask you to do now is to put those words um, on a piece of paper. And you may need to pause the video now. So pause the video and write those words down on a piece of paper. OK, and now we are going to play a word. So I am going to choose a word. And when I click on this spinner here, it's going to give us an activity to do. So let's try and see what happens. So number five, I go down to the fifth activity. And that's telling us to break the word into syllables. So if I give you the word decency, you will need to break that down into three syllables. See if you can spell the word decency by spelling out the three syllables. Do that now. So you should have written D-E-C-E-N-C-Y, decency. OK, let's try another word. Oops, I'm going to spin it, spin it again. Go back. One more word. No, it's not in it. OK, here we go. Uh, we've had five, haven't we? Let's do another one. Let's do two. Two is write a synonym for the word. And the word I'm going to give you is excellence. 
Can you give me another word for excellence? Okay, so a synonym for excellence, you could have had perfection. So these are another way that you can um, practice your spellings. You could speed write the word as many times as you can in a minute. Uh, you could break the word into syllables like we've just done. Um, and you could also see if you can find smaller words within the word and that can help you with your spellings. OK, so let's see what we wrote yesterday. Yesterday we were using our noticing skills, weren't we? And we were using um, fronted adverbials to talk about place. Let's reread what we wrote yesterday. On this crisp November morning, the ice blue hue reflected from the sky above the rooftops and onto the frost-bitten street below. In the distance, a solitary street lamp stood blinking, casting a light on the glistening scene. And some of you did some lovely examples of pathetic fall fallacy, didn't you? You were really setting up a lonely and icy cold scene ready um, which was really um, in need for some magic. And we had some lovely examples of that yesterday. So today we're going to be using some other um, ideas, other techniques to create a sense of wonder. And we're going to be using modal verbs. Modal verbs are these words here. So you've got will, would, might, may, shall. These are some modal verbs and we use these modal verbs when we talk about possibility. So for example, the basketball team could win the tournament. They could or they might not. Humpty Dumpty will fall off the wall. Well, we know that Humpty Dumpty does fall off the wall, doesn't, don't we? So will suggests that it is certain that Humpty Dumpty is going to fall off. So these words, these verbs, will, would, might, may, shall, just let us know, they indicate the level of possibility that an action may happen. And we call them modal verbs. And I always remember modal verbs by saying shoulda, woulda, coulda, modal verb. And that might work for you. So we are going to now take ourselves back to the crowd um, in the... Uh, in the Nowhere Emporium, and we're going to imagine that we are passers-by, and we're going to hear some of the questions that the crowd might be asking. So I've included some of these words. Now imagine this is our crowd down here, and I've got some of these modal verbs here. What could this be? Might it be dangerous? What might it sell? Who might own such a shop? So imagine that you're a member of this crowd here or you're passing by. What kind of questions could they be asking? And see if you can have a go at using perhaps could or might, which are modal verbs, remember, um, to and put those into a question. So have a go at writing your own questions now. See if you can use could or might. Do that now and pause the video. OK, so let's see now if we can put it into our writing. So we left off with this, didn't we? In the distance, a solitary street lamp stood blinking, casting a light on the glistening scene. All was silent until out of nowhere a strange shop appeared. Where had it come from? What might it sell? Who might own it? Could it be real? Or could it be a dream even? So look back at your work from yesterday, your beginning paragraph, and you're going to carry on now. And you are going to include your questions in your next paragraph. You might want to start off with something like all was silent or all was still. Do that now on your piece of paper. OK, and our next technique that we're going to be using today to create our sense of wonder is to use dialogue and alliteration. And we're going to be creating sentences to describe how the crowd reacts to this mysterious shop. So before we do that, can you think of um, some alliteration to describe gossiping? Now, I've got words whispered. I'm going to have to move that down now. Words whispered. You could also have, move that down, 
Um, these words here, so you could have had rumours rumbled or gossip gabbled, mutterings moved, chatter chased, nattering nabbed. So pause the video now and you can either choose um, some alliteration to describe gossiping from this list here. Or you might want to have um, a think about making your own alliteration. So what I did is I thought about a word associated with talking and then um, see if I could find another one that matched. So I thought of words and then whispered. Do that now and write it on your piece of paper. OK, and we're going to now put it into a paragraph using um, our alliteration and dialogue. Let's see how we could do it. In the street, words whispered, rumours rumbled and gossip gathered. Can you see that I have used a list of three um, alliteration, haven't I? And I've split that up by using my comma. In the street, words whispered, comma, rumours rumbled and gossip gathered. Now I've put my full stop and I've started um, my inverted commas because I'm starting dialogue. Have you seen that strange new shop, comma, I'm sure it wasn't there yesterday. Now I've used that comma there to separate the speech because I'm indicating that another person is speaking. I'm listing the dialogue that I can hear. So it's similar to up here, isn't it? Where I'm list, uh, listing the, um, the uh, gossiping. So that's another way that you can create the sense of wonder. It's giving the impression that people are um, gathering round and gossiping, isn't it? And you've shown this by just showing snippets of uh, the conversation to your reader and you can do that by listing snippets of the conversation and to do that you need to make sure that you're putting in your comma so it's clear that one person is um, speaking and you're and that you're just listing what is being said so um, have a go with it then year fives you are going to be doing today you're going to make sure that you are now writing the second part of your um, prologue. So you are writing the part where you are using dialogue and alliteration using this example here and you are going to um, write this um, down using the um, modal verbs that we have spoken about in your paragraph. So I'm looking for the second part, the second paragraph, um, the first part using modal verbs, and then the second part using your alliteration and dialogue. And I very much look forward to seeing your work.